Hello everyone and welcome back. So today we have a really fun one. This is a resorption repair. So patient came in, nice young guy, asymptomatic, just saw it on a routine finding. It was not there in any of the historical x-rays. So we decided it was time to get inside and clean this out. You can see it's right along the buccal surface there. It does kind of go down a little bit uh, sub uh, crustily. So he through say class three, four-ish as far as this one. It wasn't bad enough that I was recommending extraction. You can see there I was able to get a probe into it as well. So I knew we were gonna start seeing some issues here. Here. Ended up using calcium hydroxide for this, finished up the case, and what you're gonna be seeing now is the surgical portion, which more than likely means YouTube's gonna demonetize this. But once again, that doesn't really matter because I'm not monetized at this point anyway. So there's more for uh, anyone out there kind of interested in it. You can see right what we're doing now is gonna go and start laying the flap. Um, I had finished the root canal before this, and so you can see the gingiva was a little bit, that little slice there, that was actually from the rubber dam, uh, the number nine being on top of there. So what I'm doing here is taking a 15 blade, and I'm trying to keep this as conservative as possible. The It's not that far down as far as the actual exposed area, and I'm gonna try to keep this pretty conservative here because it does still look very nice. So I'm just going to do an envelope flap, no verticals on this one whatsoever. Um, I didn't get out the, I have a nice <laughs> kit for Apicos and then I have like a quick and dirty kit for whenever I do an extraction and this is the quick and dirty kit. So I think I'm going to be buying a nicer elevator because when you <laughs> zoom in and see the size of that number nine, you're like, oh my God, that thing's huge. And when you look at my Apico videos, you can see I have a much nicer uh, elevator for that. But what we're doing now is you can uh, definitely see right there the exposed area where the resorptive defect is. Just taking my time here to gently tease back these papilla because um, that's going to be what's going to hold this mostly in place. So I want to keep these as intact as possible. You can see a tiny, tiny little tear between six and seven there as well. So we'll fix that when we go back to do the sutures. But what we're doing right now, you can see right there, that is what resorption looks like. That spot, that is exactly where it tunneled through. So with ECIR, the cells that cause this come from the PDL and from the gingiva tissue. It doesn't actually come from the bone. And so those osteoclasts actually come through the soft tissue and start to attack onto the enamel and that's what we're seeing here. So what I'm trying to do is get this area completely exposed so I can get in there and clean it out. Now this is going to be a little bit tedious. I did cut out some of the extra parts because it does take some time to get all of the resorption out. What I like to do in these cases is I will start the case and then use calcium hydroxide as a way to help kind of kill any remaining parts inside there. You can see that's where the resorptive defects looks like, so there's still a photo there. And so what I like to do is use that calcium hydroxide, like I said, to kind of remove anything on the internal aspect, and then we're gonna go in and do the external repair here. So starting off with just a round diamond, what I'm gonna do is kind of brush up almost a little bit higher than you would think, because what I want to be able to do is hide the transition from the tooth to the composite itself. Itself. You'll want to get a shade before you do anything here because even putting the rubber dam on is going to dry out that tooth, which will affect the shade. So this was an A2 um, is what we're going to end up using to repair that. And you want to make sure you use a nice uh, color that's going to be a little translucent, but you also want to make sure that it's not too translucent. I've, I've made that mistake before as well. So we're going to be using Shofu's product here. You'll see that in a few minutes. Um, but what we're doing is just slowly going in and starting to remove that resorptive area. You can see that it's really not bleeding inside there, which makes me feel confident that the calcium hydroxide hopefully did something. <laughs> uh, when I, I took my calcium hydroxide shot a month ago, I was hoping that we'd see a little bit more, um, you know, penetration into the actual area, but unfortunately no go there. So now I'm using that little skinny diamond to just start to get up into anything. And what you can do is actually feel uh, at this point where the soft area is because the blood supply has gone in and actually created like these little tunnels. So it doesn't feel like you're prepping normal tooth structure. It actually feels like it's soft, that it has, you know, holes in it like Swiss cheese because that's what it does have in there. So what we're gonna do now is try to see where exactly it is. So I found that this disclosing solution does a great job showing you the presence of the resorption. It's, you know, it's designed to show bacteria, but in this case, what it's able to do is show any of those little invasive areas where the blood supply got inside the tooth. Um, and so I'll be going back and forth multiple times with it. So you can see most of it there is at the apical portion. I'm going to be mostly focusing on that as we go through here. Uh, spoiler alert, the final x-ray I'm not super pleased with. Um, it, it, it did not go down as far as I want. We'll talk about that when I go to the x-ray and what I think I could have done differently here. But 
the option was either kind of destroy the tooth and the bone and the existing tooth structure to get it all out to make the x-ray look pretty or find a nice compromise of I have really sound enamel there I'm not worried about any other areas penetrating through because you can see on the comb beam it doesn't the 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 point at which the resorption entered the tooth is supracrestal. So what I've done is I have not touched any of the bone here. I don't want to touch the bone. I want to leave it healthy where it is. And you can see there's still a nice ring of enamel, even though it is very skinny in there, there's still a nice ring of enamel around the outside. So I'm not as concerned. Um, and like I said, going back here again, this is, <laughs> this is a little tedious here, but I knew I was going to be talking a little bit more than normal about resorption. So I'm okay to keep that in. Um, and it's still way down if so at this point, I mean, we are, we're going down. You can see here with the, the burr in a second, it's going down quite a ways to get that out. And I'm kind of flipping between, sorry, this one isn't stabilized, but I wanted to show you the, how I was doing this very awkward angle to go inside there. You almost have to look, brush a little bit, look, brush a little bit more because the other option is just taking away so much tooth structure. You're going to really damage it and make it, you know, this is his front tooth He's a nice young guy and he never had any symptoms on this at all. So if I'm going to be convinced him to do treatment I have to make sure that the result is as good as it can be so looking inside they're going in once more time and you can actually use the endo explorer too um, just to kind of feel if there's any spots where it dips into at this point we're really far down there but it did feel nice and solid so what I've done now is put the rubber dam in the flap is still open I haven't closed it up the reason why is I want to have a really really clean surface for when we go in and do the restorative aspect so first thing I did there was put a little bit of viscous stat on the interproximal area where the papilla is i wish i had a laser here because that'd probably be better for healing um, but i didn't want to use heat or cauterization because that's going to kill the tissue and i want this to adhere so if you know of a better option besides viscostat please comment below but what we're doing now is going in with the blaster because i'm going to be doing my normal bonding process just like we would for any other patient um, still a little bit right down in the apical area and that's what you can see me kind of going in on but right now the rubber dam is actually on tooth structure when i've done these in the past the resorption of it has been so deep that it's actually gone straight to that area where the bone meets the tooth and you actually have to put it on there so you can see right in that spot right there still a little bit of resorption so i'm going to go back in and remove that just want to get out as much as possible using that endo explorer you can see the stick right there and that is exactly where it is so going with the long skinny diamond just to kind of gently buzz that area out there you go as you can see getting that spot there once again sorry for the stabilization artifacts there but i wanted to show what this looked like and i had to go at some pretty extreme angles because as you can see this is not a normal endo access <laughs> so to use the scope and be able to see everything it's kind of a weird one so what i'm doing now is this is a you can shout out to dr geisberger from uop of using those little areas and you can almost create these little divots and what that does is it hides that transition from the composite to the tooth itself so it almost looks like little mammalons that you're creating or like little uh, you know developmental grooves inside that area but what that does is it hides the transition from the composite to the actual tooth structure because any sharp lines or really obvious things like that are going to catch the eye and because this is his front tooth and everything else looks completely natural i want to make sure that this has the best chance whatsoever so we're going back in blasting again so the blaster and the uh we gotta i, I know i'm not paid by bioclear but i probably should be after this video because we use so many other products <laughs> um getting that all cleaned out to make sure we get a really solid nice good um seal there and you can see Finally, we're looking good down at that apical area. So we're going to dry this and then um, make sure we get that nice bonding process. So we're going to get that started here. Um, looking down at that area, you can see it looking much, much better down at the apical region. So we're going to start off here with the normal etch like we would for everything. You want to take it up onto the tooth as well. Remember, we're going to be bonding. It's going to get thin up there for sure, but we want that to be looking as clean as possible as far as that transition line going in. And that is what it looks like when it's all cleaned up. You can see those little grooves that I made just to help kind of hide that transition line. So going in now with this same prime and bond that we would use for any case um, works great in something like this. And just remember the rubber dam is there because we want to have this be as clean as possible. It's it's still bleeding. Thankfully, his tissue was very healthy. I didn't really have to flap back that far, so I'm not too concerned about, you know, trauma to the area. Um, but going in with prime and bond like we would normally. And then as far as the filling material, this is where I feel like I probably should have done something a little bit different. Um, spoiler alert, like I said, the 
the composite really doesn't get into the apical aspect of the resorption here, even though it looks super clean on, you know, clinically. So I'm not worried about the tooth failing or anything. It's just the x-ray doesn't look as good as it could be. I'm thinking if I were to do this again, I'm gonna actually try to use the BioClear product and actually inject in mold and use the heated composite. I just used the Shofu stuff here. Um, I've been playing around with a few different ones for my aesthetic work. Um, and I got some samples from uh, actually our Shine rep who, give us this shofu stuff and i really have enjoyed it it is very very nice to work with that's not heated it's that nice to work with from the very beginning and it polishes up just beautifully so if i were to do this again what i would end up doing is using a heated composite with flowable and then injection molding the um packable or whatever you know, Davey wants to call it <laughs> on top of there because I think it would have kind of pushed it more into those areas that would be the one thing I would change here um, aesthetically and clinically it looks great it's just the x-ray that you'll see here in a little bit that I wish could be a little bit better so at this point the composites on looks great now we have to polish it so we're going to take the rubber dam off and start our polishing um, aspect here i'm starting off with our regular diamond it's a coarse burr and that just gets my rough shape here i want to get those big parts out because this is going to be by far your most important um thing to do is make sure that this is as smooth as possible. Now, I know some people like to use Geristore or a GI to repair these cases because there is a little bit of chance for attachment on there. I've done that in the past, and what I found is if there's any recession or if the area is exposed, those materials look terrible. And what happens is the patient is going to hate it, and they're going to actually go in and have it replaced. Um, and I, ask me how I know this. <laughs> I had one that looked gorgeous on the x-ray. It was perfect. It just didn't match very well uh, clinically because it was kind of a whatever GI. And she went and had her general dentist drill it out and put a new one in, and it looked terrible big overhangs just causing all this bleeding issue so uh, i've learned that it may not be as great as far as reattachment but for aesthetics it's okay if the gum tissue doesn't attach in this area and there's a small probing so what i'm using now is a very fine flame burr to shape most importantly that area where the composite touches the apical extent of the root surface because you want that to be as smooth as possible if there's any catches there the gums are going to bleed like crazy it's going to have recession it's going to have issues so i spend a lot of extra time here i found that these little uh polishing stones work great for this too to just create as smooth a surface as possible and pretty much for the next minute all you're going to see me doing is just trying to create a very polished polished smooth surface to make sure it looks great one thing to remember is when you go inside there you i like to use the fine diamonds actually dry because a, I'm not I'm barely touching these whatsoever so I'm not worried about causing any heat trauma but more importantly the dust will actually get caught in any voids and you saw right at the zenith there there was a little bit of a void and so I was able to go back in there and use that to fix it once you get the apical portion done what you're then going to want to do is shape kind of that buckle aspect right where it's going to emerge that emergence profile is very important as well for the gingival tissue and so what I'm doing here is shaping that as well as that transition zone from the composite into the tooth itself and so you can see the that Geisberger trick works extremely well I've used that since dental school uh, he's no longer teaching there unfortunately but if you want a really good dentist in Marin <laughs> he'll get you all set up and we're gonna go in and polish it now so I'm using the BioClear they have a rock star system which is if you know David Clark it's a perfect name for him he is an absolute rock star and so this polish stuff works really well now, yes, the flap is still open. And so you're gonna see me do a lot of rinsing here to make sure any of that is kind of kept out of the way. I did have the Minnesota on there to help protect it so that you wouldn't have any of that material go you know, into the flap itself, but lots and lots of rinsing here because you don't want to leave any of that. They then have this little diamond polisher that finishes everything up. And this is a great, great, great polisher. Even if you don't use the BioClear system, this is, I've actually gotten rid of all my discs and all the normal stuff that we've used in the past because I like this material so well. It really does. I mean, you can see the shine there even through the blood. It really, really does work well. Once again, going in with a lot of rinsing here, just in case any particles get locked inside there. You don't want to create any foreign body reactions or nastiness like that. Quick photo here to show you what it looks like. So you can really not even tell that transition. Um, it, it, I'm really pleased with how this turned out. So go ahead and do the sutures now. What I decided to do was do a pass through um, in between kind of around seven and use that as my strength to kind of help uh, just keep the 
tension on the flap so that we don't have as you know recession um i uh, not sure if this actually works if peridona shut me out in the comments but i like to if i'm doing anything aesthetically i like to keep the flap almost a millimeter high anticipating that there will be some resorption does it make a difference probably not <laughs> the gums are going to go where the gums want to go but by doing this where you loop through and actually grab into the papilla on either side it's a very strong suture that's going to hold that gingiva really nicely in place and so i did this over seven first because i'm not as concerned if there's some recession on seven because it's a completely natural tooth and it's going to look pretty much normal so what i decided to do here was keep that in the normal area like we would for a normal suture and then i'm going to do a single one through the papilla picking up the palatal tissue to position the papilla between seven and eight in the most ideal spot um so unfortunately you can see the suture got caught on his beard there <laughs> that's what you're seeing as me trying to fix that and also not pull through so we're going to go through here the one thing i don't love about this is it does leave that little horizontal line along the buckle there um it, can it cause scarring technically yes and it can push on the gingiva just a little bit more however it's such a strong suture that i like combining these two together to get the most optimal aesthetic outcome um once again if there's a better way out there, I, I, I'm not up to date on all the perio literature. Um, so if there is a better way from an aesthetic standpoint, please let me know because um, I'm always open to changing things. But this seems to work really well. What this does though, you can see how it compresses the papilla um, on to seven. So what I'm gonna do now is get the papilla between seven and eight exactly where I want it. And the way we're gonna do that is by going through, grabbing the palatal tissue here, which is what you're gonna see me do in just a second, coming back through the papilla and then suturing that up. What this does is it creates tension straight down the middle of the papilla and creates a nice area where it's going to heal up exactly where I want to. If I, I technically I probably could leave it where it is right now, the, the flap's not going anywhere, but that tension is now pulling both uh, six and eight on those aspects on the either side of seven inward into seven. So it's going to create kind of a weird looking, um, papilla and I think it could cause more recession in that area so you can see you come right back through here grab right next to where that original one is grab his beard again <laughs> and then what you're going to do is just suture that back up and you can see as I pull tension here after Jenny dries that area out it's going to almost recenter you see it plumping up that papilla into that area and that's the tension we want to have on there it's difficult to shape gingiva to where you want it to go near impossible but I, I found that if you take a little extra time here and get it to where you want it to be you can see right there as we pull it tight it's going to almost plump that tissue up exactly where I want it to go as we pull tightly into that area nice yeah so pushing that up and you can see the coverage on the um, distal aspect of eight now is much 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 better but that's it for sutures um, very simple and you'll see here in a second what it looks like post-operatively you can barely even tell something was done on there um, we'll rinse them out and get a nice picture here for you but um, you'll also get to see my beautiful x-ray that I'm not super happy with <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and clip these off and show you what that looks like once it's all cleaned so really nice as far as the papilla shape between them you can almost see it's worse between eight and nine I didn't even touch that but that's the issue is we were not able to get the composite to flow into the apical extent of the resorption however because we had enough good tissue and I'm not really worried about it the area there in between is looking really solid so I don't think we're gonna have any issues as far as recurrence with this um, I'll definitely keep an eye on it obviously but kind of an interesting one resorption is not something we get to see every day we are seeing more of it I'm very curious as to why if anyone knows if there's something you know in the water or what the heck's going on um, but we're seeing way more resorption than we did years ago so that's kind of the case there once again any questions go ahead drop them in the comment otherwise I will see you guys next time